Good morning and welcome to Peace Lutheran Fellowship on this uh, beautiful fall morning. Uh, thank you for joining us here today. We're on the 25th Advent, the 25th Sunday after Advent. So we're at the end of the road here. We're going to be talking about the end of the story a little bit today. Next week is Christ the King, and that's the end of the church year, and we'll be starting a new one with our Advent then. And so, yeah, thank you for joining us, and let us begin our worship. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. let us confess our sin in the presence of God and one another. Have mercy on us, O God. We confess that we have sinned against you and against our neighbor. We have built walls instead of tables and have turned away the stranger. We have sought glory for ourselves and have treasured that which does not satisfy us. Help us to love as you love, to welcome those you sin, and to treasure mercy and justice. Turn us from our ways to your ways, and free us to serve those in need. Amen. Now hear the good news. God who makes all things new forgives your sins for Jesus' sake and remembers them no more. Lift up your heads and your hearts. Yours is the kingdom of God. Amen. Amen. Christ, the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Thank you. 
Let us pray. Almighty God, your sovereign purpose brings salvation to birth. Give us faith to be steadfast amid the tumults of this world, trusting that your kingdom come and your will is done through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. <laughs> from Daniel. The book of Daniel is concerned with God's revelation about the end times and the coming kingdom of God, when God will vindicate the righteous who have been persecuted. A reading from Daniel. At that time, Michael, the great prince, the protector of the people, shall arise. There shall be a time of anguish such as has never occurred since nations first came into existence. But at that time your people shall be delivered, everyone who is found written in the book. Many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting and some to shame and everlasting contempt, uh, everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. Those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the sky, and those who lead many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God.
stands day after day at his service, offering again and again the same sacrifices that can never take away sins. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God and since then has been waiting until his enemies would be made a footstool for his feet. For by a single offering, he has perfected for all time those who are sanctified. And the Holy Spirit also testifies to us for after saying, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their hearts and I will write them on their minds. He also adds, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. Where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer any offering for sin. Therefore, my friends, since we have confidence to enter the sanctuary by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he has opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us approach with a true heart and full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clear from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who has promised is faithful. And let us consider how to provoke one another to love and good deeds, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as we see the day approaching. Word of God, word of God. Please stand if you are able for the gospel application. Bible said to him, Look, teacher, what large stones and what large buildings. Then Jesus asked him, Do you see these great buildings? Not one stone will be left here upon another. All will be thrown down. When he was sitting on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter, James, John, and Andrew asked him privately, Tell us, when will this be? And what will be the sign that all these things are about to be accomplished? Then Jesus began to say to them, Beware that no one leads you astray. Many will come in my name and say, I am he. And they will lead many astray. When you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. This must take place. But the end is still to come. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places. There will be famines. This is but the beginning of the birth pains. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. You may be seated. Every story needs an end. And when we look at scripture, we kind of see a little bit of a, I don't know if you'd say scary, or I had a Bible professor call it spooky. He said he didn't ever read Revelation because he read it once because it was too spooky for him. But he wrote, but he wrote commentaries on other other books. But uh, that one he just kind of skipped because there's something about these things, this end times, the stories that come along with it, the way it's looked at that really, um, you know, can go get us going in kind of weird directions. And if you think about the end times. Right, I, I didn't grow up in the church, so my only experience with end times was through popular culture, TV, rock music especially, uh, all that stuff during the 80s, and uh, movies and things like that. And if you have trouble sleeping like I do, maybe you rummage through the channels at night, 
to see what's on. And if you look at like kind of the History Channel or Discovery Channel or the Travel Channel, you'll see all kinds of good shows like uh, Finding Bigfoot. You'll see ones about aliens looking for those. And you know, me and my brother used to always hound my dad. You know, tell us about Area 51. Tell us about that. But he never uh, let on. And uh, but there's all kinds of shows. You know, the Loch Ness monster. There's um, you know all kinds of shows that they will go and Atlantis especially. I like Atlantis a lot too. But often the end times is a part of that group of shows that are on, right? You'll see like Nostradamus of course is the big one that they'll talk about his predictions. And sometimes they'll talk even about the what scripture has to say about that. And then they'll tie it to various things with the, of course the Antichrist rising up and the one world government and all that. And so what are, you know, as, uh, you know, regular folks, and what are we supposed to do with all this we see? We see it on TV, we hear it in uh, movies and music, and, you know, there's books written about this that just kind of elaborate and elaborate and take a part of scripture and then build a whole story about it. But what we see here are, are, is something that's very important, and it's important for us to understand that we can't just dismiss this stuff, that the, uh, the, the stories, these uh, predictions, this uh, literature that is in scripture is there for a reason. And, you know, some would like to dismiss it all together and say, oh, well, this is hyperbolic speaking. They're speaking about these things that are going to happen that, and they're just way over exaggerating. And, but the place we can come to, whether we totally go with you know, what's the, the literal saying right before our eyes that we look at, or we dig deep and really look into the different connections and what it might be alluding to in these passages. What we can see is that it isn't going to be comfortable, right? It isn't going to be a rose garden. It isn't going to be this uh, nice, sweet time where everything is just uh, hunky-dory and we hold hands and play ring around the rose. And that there's something that's going to happen, that uh, things are going to fall apart, that our um, world the way it is cannot sustain itself and we know this through various aspects of our lives whether it be our environment we know that the environment is not in a state in which it can sustain we know our political uh, system is not in a place that it can sustain that there is conflict that is arising and growing within it and within the world our resources and our um, you know, ability to care for each individual's needs is not uh, uh, able, we're not able to do that now, whether we don't have enough resources or the resources are uh, squandered in such a way that um, there are people on earth that aren't able to live healthy, comfortable lives. And for them, it is the end times. It is this dark, dreary day that we see in scripture. And, uh, so we pick up today back in Mark, right? We've been in John a little bit. We talked about uh, Reformation Sunday. We talked about uh, All Saints Sunday last week. And so we're, we were talking and we were in John and those. But now we're back in Mark. And if you remember Mark, they were traveling, right? The disciples of Jesus were traveling and they were coming all the way from the top of the um, Lake of Galilee and they were coming down to head to Jerusalem. If you remember, there was this pattern that happened on this trip. Is And what would happen is that um, the disciples would say something crazy, and Jesus would correct them and then teach them. And that's kind of, you know, and then Jesus would tell them first what his plan was, why he was coming to earth, why this uh, figure of this God in the flesh would come to earth, and he would talk about what needed to take place in Jerusalem as they were heading there. And so now we find ourselves there, you know, we're in the midst of Holy Week and all that stuff, and usually, you know, if you think of the structure of how things go, you go from now, where you had a, um, the uh, triumphal entry, and then they go into Jerusalem, and there's various things going on. And so, but with the way that the lectionary works, of course, we come to the end here, but the uh, and for Jesus is a totally uh, different time in Easter when he goes uh, and uh, is crucified and rises from the dead. 
But here we are, and Jesus is with his disciples, and they had just gone to the temple. He had uh, you know, done the temple stuff where he gets the whip and drives out the money changers and things. Uh, he had condemned the uh, scribes and really you know, let them have it. And now they're kind of walking away, right? They're heading out of the temple. I think uh, maybe Matthew uses a little bit more uh, figurative than that, is that they're walking away from the temple outside of the temple and they look at this huge building this big building and that's just magnificent and one of the disciples asked jesus look at those stones he didn't even ask him he just makes a comment look at those stones look at how that's built what a wonderful thing when we think of the temple you know we think of this thing at first remember it started out as the tabernacle and it was just uh, the ark of the covenant that um, god had moses have the people fashioned, and then they put, you know, some things in there like the Ten Commandments and the Rod of Aaron. You remember that's the thing you see and a Joan at the end that melts the guy's face, and that was what they built the tabernacle around was this ark, and that was, you know, to represent the presence of God amongst them, and they had that um, in, in I think it was up in Shiloh or in that area, and then they moved that to Jerusalem and they took Jerusalem. And then uh, David wanted to build the temple, but he couldn't. And then Solomon built the temple. And then the temple was uh, you know, totally ransacked, and everybody was taken away and exiled by the Babylonians. And then they came back. And then they rebuilt the temple. But they just kind of rebuilt a, a pretty humble one, actually. And it was half the size of what this one was. But then, right just up before this time, right before I think it was like. You know, somewhere in 5 to 10 BC, Herod built another temple. Or he didn't, he built the same temple, but he just expanded it greatly and made it this real massive, fancy thing. And here they're looking at it, and Jesus is looking at it, knowing what's coming for him personally, knowing what's coming for us as the church. And he's looking at this uh, old thing, this old building, this old uh, way of doing things. He's saying that it's going to be torn to the ground. That this is not one thing going to be laid on top. Not one stone will be on top of another. That this whole entire uh, worshiping system will be done away with. And it has. It has. It has for history. There, there's the uh, dome on the rock, the mosque that sits by the Wailing Wall that's in this area. It's been controlled by. Christians during the Crusades, it's been controlled by Muslims since, and the temple doesn't exist. This type of worship of animal sacrifice and going to the temple and paying all those taxes out and all that doesn't happen anymore. So Jesus was correct in that, and some say that this was written after it happened, so that's why they're able to kind of retroactively predict and things. But what we see is that as far as we're concerned, as far as Christians are concerned, is that the temple wasn't just destroyed. And Jesus isn't just talking about the destruction of the temple, but he's also talking about um, what will take its place, and that is this new uh, worshiping community that becomes the presence of God in the world, right? And that's no longer this uh, thing that was carried around by the Israelites during those ancient times in the battle that was in the Ark of the Covenant. It's no longer the tabernacle that um, were, you know, was the center of worship for them as they traveled in, through the desert and into the promised land. It's no longer this temple that was built that, uh, where people gathered and worshiped for quite a while with David and those sort of kings. It is no longer the uh, destroyed temple that is rebuilt as people when we see in Ezra and Nehemiah they come back from exile here the desire to rebuild the city and rebuild the temple and rebuild their society and uh, be reassured that God is still with them and it's no longer this kind of facade temple that Herod built that Herod right like he took something that was legitimate something that was good and this desire to rebuild the temple and he made it into you know kind of a like casino type of place right we had the money changers we had all the courts we had 
all the places, you know, where you had to be a certain kind of person to go and worship in certain levels of this temple. So eventually you had to be the high priest who could go in once a year into the Holy of Holies. But what we see is Jesus is talking kind of like on two levels. And he, you can look at that in the languages and stuff. He's talking about in the present tense, talking about the temple, but he's also talking about kind of the bigger things in the world as well. And there's something about being human, I think, that makes us think of the end time, which is why some of those TV shows and music and things like that allude to it, because it's, it sells. It, it's something that's in us. We want to know what's going to happen in this story. We want to know what our fate is. What's the fate of our children and grandchildren? What's the fate of our world that we um, you know, care and tend for, we're called to be stewards of? Is it just, uh, you know, it's going to you know fade off, it's going to burn up in a solar flare, or does God have a plan for it and for us? And so what happens is, you know, when we know that the temple was destroyed in about 70, 70 AD, that Rome just ransacked it because the Jewish people uh, rose up and were having trouble, so they just wiped it out. And at that same time, right, that is when the faith went out from Jerusalem, that as these, uh, the society was destroyed, as their worshiping communities were destroyed, as people were displaced, the gospel went out, from Jerusalem out into the Greek-speaking world and into Europe. And so what we see, remember we talked about this last week a little bit. Last week was kind of an eschatology, the study of the end times of, of people in a way. Right? When we think of all saints. And we talked about that the uh, Reformation kind of served as a scattering point, as a diaspora for the Holy Spirit in the world. But so, and that's but that's what happened earlier in this time was this diaspora of the Holy Spirit going out, and it was no longer contained in the temple anymore. God's presence wasn't contained there. God's presence is contained in the believers, the all saints that we celebrated last week. God's presence is contained in you and in me and us. And so when we're called to be in these times, these end times that we live in, is God's presence in this world. So when we look at this passage, and we see these various passages talking about end times, we see that in the Hebrews passage, what we are given is that it isn't the end, it's a different way of uh, God's relating to us, and that is through this uh, personal relationship with God through Jesus Christ, this um, ability to be able to worship in spirit and in truth each individual. What we see is this, and we talk about it, the Reformation, and Reformation Day is the concept that Luther talked about, about the priesthood of all believers, that now it's not just these uh, high priests and these um, priest people that come from the line of Levi, that it's everyone who is in relationship with God through Jesus Christ, has the Holy Spirit within them, that God's presence is no less in you or in me than God was in the Ark of the Covenant. That that is the Holy Spirit's presence now. And it's scattered. Instead of being in one place, it's scattered throughout the world. And it keeps just scattering and scattering to get to all ends. And that is what we see in this um, Hebrew passage of when he talks, uh, the writer talks about this um, sacrifice that pays for our sins once and for all, that not only was the temple destroyed, but it, it was became obsolete before that. And that's kind of an interesting thing, because it could still just be going if it never if that never happened, and Christianity would be the opposite. But it, it, it was destroyed. And then Christianity spread like wildfire there. And um, what we see is a new time a new time of worship where not only is God's presence with us, but we can come into God's presence in worship with this bold assurance that uh, we are accepted, that we are holy, that we are um, perfected, as it says, that 
that is how we are uh, viewed by God in this um, relationship of worship. Now we see that we come in through this curtain. Remember when the crucifixion, the curtain was cut in two. And that curtain was the, the representation of the temple of the, um, you know, the distance between us and God. Um, there was a curtain between us, and that curtain was torn and two. And we come to God through that, through that space, that tear that the author of Hebrews says is Christ's body. And we think of the broken body on the table as we come and receive the, God's blessing and God's uh, nourishment and God's uh, strengthening of our faith that God gives us as we worship. So we enter this with confidence. We worship with confidence. But we don't just, you know, come and worship. We do other things as well. Is that um, we are to spur one another on to good deeds, to love and good deeds. And that's kind of where the churches work, right? Because we're in these tough times, whether it's a tough time like we're kind of now or just regular tough times, um, during this time is our word. Is, and it doesn't matter, and that's the uh, interesting thing, is it can, no matter how crazy it gets out in the world, no matter how hard it gets, no matter if we're talking like the All Saints and talking about the martyrs who gave up their lives for the faith, that um, our response, how we are to be in this world is always the same. No matter how hard it is for to love our neighbor, love God, spur one another on to good deeds, like it says here, to show love and see, you know, the worship of our Lord. And that doesn't and, and that's how we're supposed to be all the time, regardless if the temple's being destroyed or the cities are being ransacked or our lives are in upheaval or we're having health issues in our own personal lives or stuck or whatever is that we have a way to be, and that is to kind of enter the space of worship, enter the space of God's presence with us, God's blessing on you, saying, I love you, you are a valuable person to me. Now go and be me in this world, and that's what we're called to be. You see, because, you know, when we look at this stuff, we think of, okay, Jesus is building a new temple. He's building a new people of God to go be the priests of God in this world, and that's what happened back then. But Jesus is also building a new world. You see, Jesus has a new world in mind in which every person in this world is a priest, and Jesus, and every person in this world is um, working to, to and for and with all these other people that serve God. And that's what God wants for us, is a, a, a world of peace and love and sharing and kindness and goodness and all those sort of things. And he says that the way to do this is through the curtain. Is to walk in through the curtain, through that torn curtain, and receive God's mercy upon our lives. And when we do that, we can begin to share that mercy and that love and that kindness and that grace with others, but this is the way through. This is the way to it. It's through the curtain. And uh, as Jesus is constructing or destructing or whatever the heck's going on in this new world, we're called to follow along and be with God and to turn this world back to the way it's supposed to be, one screw at a time, one nut at a time, one you know uh, piece of uh, material at a time, we build this uh, new world back together. And as we saw, you remember last week, there was a this massive macro scale of God's presence. We saw that picture of God's presence coming down like the new city of Jerusalem, right? Coming down and setting on this world. And that's the picture we're given, is that there's going to be a time and uh, we, you know, there's a lot of different ways to explain it, and there are a lot of different ways we can think of how it might go, but at some point, there's going to be a time when God's presence is on this world, 
like we haven't felt before. But there's going to maybe be some struggles before then. And we all know maybe this is just the time of struggle. Maybe there'll be an amplified time of struggle. Maybe this is it. I don't know. The COVID thing is kind of crazy in that regard. But um, God's presence is coming for us and with us. And he calls us to be um, in that relation. And it's so important. We can see that just even in our times nowadays that how we deal with people is so important. And whether we show grace or contempt, whether we join the fighting or we kind of pull our back outside of the fighting and say, hey, we're going to be a different type of people in this time and in this place. And so that's where we're at. And that's where um, we're called to be God's uh, temple in this world. But God, we're called to be God's presence in this world. And we can do that um, because of these great pictures, these great um powerful and maybe scary sometimes pictures we see, but what they give us is an assurance that um, not only is God in control, but God has a plan and God will um, see that plan through. And we're kind of, in some ways we're along for the ride, but we're always invited to be a part of that work as well. So let us consider that.
I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. As together we join our hearts in our prayers of intercession. Eternal God, you hold firm amid the changes of this world. Hear us now as we pray for the church, the world, and everyone in need. God, our creator, you show us the path of life. Bless thankful people everywhere with humility as they extend compassion to those who have experienced harm in religious spaces. Cultivate healthy congregations that tell of and enact your reconciling love. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God, our constant, you love our universe from beginning to end. As the seasons change, protect animals that migrate and hibernate. Bring them safety to a sheltered place and a more abundant season. God, in your mercy, hear our prayers. God, our ruler, you write your law on human minds and hearts. Give wisdom to all elected leaders and officials to govern with insight and compassion. Make them mindful of the well-being of all people so that your world will flourish. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God, our stronghold, you are present amid disaster. We pray for those affected by natural disasters. Come to the aid of all survivors of earthquakes, famines, floods, hurricanes, and wildflowers, wild, wildfires, and the first responders who support them. Calm their fear, supply their need, and be the solid ground beneath their feet. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God, our guide, you are greater than we can imagine. Surround congregations with your expansive inclusion. Be present in the midst of disagreements, differences, and questions. Unite people of diverse viewpoints in the love of Christ. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We share in the grief of many within our community. We share in the grief of the Layton family upon the death of Carolyn's brother, and in the Matthews family in the death of Carrie's mother and the Wagner family in the deaths of both Joe and Claudia. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God, our beginning and our end, your beloved people shine like the brightness of the sky. We thank you for the lives of all who rest in your eternal mercy from famous saints to the people we have loved and have named. Assure us of your resurrection promise. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. 
God, our hope and strength, we entrust to you all for whom we pray. Remain with us always through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. And also with you. Let us share that peace with one another in an appropriate way. Bell Lord, 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 chosen to dwell among your creatures. Come among us now in these gifts of bread and wine, and strengthen us to be your body for the world, through Jesus Christ our Lord. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, Almighty and merciful God, through our Savior, Jesus Christ, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the host of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. God, you are most holy, and great is the majesty of your glory. You so love the world that you gave your only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but have eternal life. We give you thanks for his coming into the world to fulfill for us your holy will, and to accomplish all things for our salvation. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks and broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. 
Again, after supper, he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it for all the drinks, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. For as often as we eat of this bread and drink from this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Christ is dying. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Remembering, therefore, his salutary command, his life-giving passion and death, his glorious resurrection and ascension, and the promise of his coming again, we give thanks to you, O Lord God Almighty, not as we ought, but as we are able. We ask you mercifully to accept our praise and thanksgiving, and with your word and Holy Spirit, bless us, your servants, and these your own gifts of bread and wine, so that we and all who share in the body and blood of Christ may be filled with heavenly blessing and grace, and receiving the forgiveness of sin, may be formed to live as your holy people, and be given our inheritance with all your saints. To you, O God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be all honor and glory in your holy church, now and forever. Amen. 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 Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, but we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation. But deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. All are welcome to this table. All are welcome to walk through the broken body of our Lord Jesus Christ and receive his uh, body and his blood, his bread and his wine. All are welcome, all who would come forward to receive. A feast of love is offered here for you and for all the saints. Come.
Let us pray. Blessed Jesus, at this table you have been for us, both host and meal. Now send us forth to extend our tables and to share your gifts until that day when all, when all feast together at your heavenly banquet. Amen. study this Wednesday. I have a conference I'm going to at the Synod and the rest of the first call pastors in the region and so I'll be doing that on my computer but I won't be available so I won't be I don't get to go anywhere. Um, that's too bad yes. And then uh, of course after uh, the service today we're going to have a discussion that we weren't able to have last week as far as our um, congregational meeting so if you'd like to be a part of that and you know make sure it's a real congregational meeting where we drag it out and keep arguing or something uh, please be a part of that so we gotta make it official we gotta make it official so we gotta drag it out so please be a part of that um any other announcements well i'm grateful for the fact that we had some additional servants of the lord come in today and help with things like greeting and bulletin folding and putting out the Bibles and the, the Evangelical Lutheran worship books and all of those things. And so that was, I'm very, very grateful for that. So yeah, thank we're thankful. You. And I apologize, I meant to remind you that uh, we have Bibles and hymnals if you need them. So please, if you're able Well, they somehow seem to have made the rounds that they were needed. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. Okay, any others? Okay, just bless your people. All right. <laughs> Now receive the blessing. God, the beginning and the end, who has written your name in the book of life, bless and keep you in grace and peace from this time forth and forevermore. Amen. Amen.